Okay, it's three past ten. So let's start officially. So hello everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the talk of Sebastian Gold, who is going to tell us on the importance of higher order input statistics for learning with neural networks. So Sebastian did his PhD at the University of Stuttgart where he worked on stochastic thermodynamics of learning. And then he spent uh, three years as a postdoc with Florent Grischer-Kala and Lenka Stemborava in Paris. And then he were, was working on the interface of machine learning and statistical physics. And then in September 2020, he joined CISA Trieste, where he is now working on theories for learning artificial and biological neural networks and especially he's focusing on the interplay of data structure, learning rule, and architecture shapes in learning. So welcome, Sebastian, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you for the very nice introduction and for for in, inviting me. Um, it's really cool. I, I, I looked a little bit through the through the previous talk, and it looks like a really cool series of, of talks, so I'm very happy to to, to contribute. And yeah, like uh, like Karin said, so what I'm going to talk about is is you know broadly speaking theory of of, of neural networks. And as Karin also told you, you know I, I come from physics, from statistical physics. So my approach is of course heavily influenced um, by that by that background. But um, yeah, let's let's jump right in. Also, I I don't really see what's happening on the Zoom, but I'll you know. Given this, this is an online talk. I'd like to try to make it still as interactive as possible. So, if you have any questions, you know, just sort of, I guess the best is just unmute yourself and speak up, and and then I'll I'll, I'll try to to answer all your questions. Uh, but yeah, just make sure that you speak up because otherwise I probably don't see you. You can also just uh, type it into the chat, and I will monitor the chat and then raise the voice for you if if there's trouble with uh, the audio on your side. Ah, perfect, perfect. Thank you, Karen. All right, yeah, so let's jump right in. So um, I guess, you know, if you're, if you're here, then you probably know that, you know, a lot of the progress in, in machine learning in the last few years has been powered by applications of neural networks, right? So um, I could have picked any of a number of examples here, and, you know, showing you a game of Go, which is, of course, the big success story in, in, in reinforcement learning. Uh, if, if, like me, you're living abroad, you will have noticed that Everything that has to do with machine translation, natural language processing has massively uh, improved over the last couple of years uh, to the point where it's really become a useful tool now. And, and you know, these are not just uh, nice applications outside of science, but also within science, uh, machine learning is having quite an impact, right? And I think maybe one of the biggest breakthroughs in, in machine learning really over the last 10 years has been the development or the prediction of the 3D structure of, of proteins from their... Uh, amino acid sequence, right, which used to be a big problem in structural biology, and here reinforcement learning really has made huge progress uh, in the last one or two years with Arthur Fold. But at the same time, I think it's it's not hyperbole to say that the gap between what these neural networks can do and, and what we understand about them and uh, it has never been bigger, right? And so this is quite a challenge, and um, it's quite an appealing challenge, and it's attracted people from many different fields, math, physics, statistics, theoretical computer science, um, and so while there is not a clear sort of consensus uh, on, on how neural networks or why neural networks work so well, I think what's emerging is a sort of picture in which it's clear that it's not just one thing uh, that you need to understand to understand how neural networks work, right? But it's rather an interplay of, of several things. And um, there's different versions of what these three things could be. I'm giving you a few references here below. But basically, I think you can summarize them as uh, the three pillars being data structure, network architecture, and the learning algorithm, okay? So what do I mean by these uh, by these three things? So uh, if you talk about data structure, what I mean is that most of the inputs that neural networks work on, they're not just random IID Gaussian inputs, even though we like this assumption in theory, right? But they have particular structure. So if you think, for example, about images, they're very high dimensional objects. And so you might think that, you know, the curse of dimensionality is gonna be, uh, very bad if you try to learn anything about images, but then neural networks manage to do so quite well. And one of the hypotheses about this is that they manage to do so quite well because even though images are high dimensional, the you know in the space of of high dimensional inputs, those inputs that we recognize as images, at least as human observers, they really concentrate on some kind of lower dimensional manifold in input space, 
okay and this manifold it's you know it's very non-linear it's very curvy so you can't easily just write it down but it is tangible like you can for example measure its dimension uh using different techniques and then you'll find that in fact the dimensionality of this manifold is maybe one percent of of the dimensionality of the whole of input space okay so this is one example of of data structure that i think any successful theory of of neural networks will have to take into account the second um important thing is architecture so you may know there are these these universality theorems already dating back to the 80s which tell you that uh, you can approximate any function uh, to any degree of accuracy with just a two-layer neural network so two layers of weights one hidden layer of neurons and this is very nice and this sounds very cool when you first see it uh, then after a while you realize that this is actually something that you probably already knew from from undergrad it's just you know another way of stating something like Fourier's uh, theorem for example about function decomposition the catch of course is you know how many neurons do you need in that hidden layer and there the bad news is that the number of neurons that you need it will scale sort of exponentially in the input size so it's not really feasible in in, in practice and in practice of course people don't use very wide shadow networks they use deep networks right and this is why the whole field is called deep learning and depth really is crucial in practice for many reasons um and i would say for many reasons that we don't really understand it from a theoretical point of view uh, you know depth is not something you would want to have like it you would think that it makes your optimization much harder you would think that it makes learning much harder but in in practice it's absolutely crucial and and this is another thing that you know as as a theorist uh, we should we should aim to explain and then finally the third pillar here is, is the learning algorithm right so once you have a nice data set uh, once you have a nice architecture for your neural network you still need to find the weights and in, in theory you know a priori this is an mpa hard problem so what you do in practice is you do something very approximate you do a local search right you start with some random initial conditions and then you just do a first order optimization method you just do stochastic gradient descent on your on your loss and the the magic if you will of of deep learning is that somehow this local method manages to find very good minima of your training loss okay so this local optimization procedure that started somewhere in this very sort of rugged uh, loss landscape it manages to to go down this loss landscape and find a solution that not just fits the training data well but also generalizes and so i think you know this is the third uh, thing that we would like to understand is how is it that these simple local search methods generalize so well so this is to give you sort of a broad um sort of overview over what i think are sort of the interesting directions of, of of neural network theory and then you know now when you have a particular problem you can think about it along these three dimensions okay and so also in this talk you know i'd like you to keep these three dimensions in the back of your mind and then see how they interact um in 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 practice and so the problem that i want to talk about has to do with um data symmetries and architecture okay and the idea here is that if you have uh, invariances in your data you really want to exploit them for efficient learning so for example if you think about image classification uh there is a certain symmetry in the data which is some kind of translation symmetry right so for example these two images uh, of a dog well you should classify them as a dog no matter whether the dog is on the left or on the right right so in classification the labels should be invariant to the translation symmetry of that object or if you want to segmentate the object if you're looking for the bounding box of that dog you know the, the red square well that should move the same way as the mo dog moves across the image right so it should be equivariant images have this this translation uh, invariance and of course you know the the way to to exploit that if you're training a neural network is to use a convolutional neural network right so the appropriate network architecture here for images is not some kind of fully connected neural network but instead this convolutional network um here i'm showing you an example of the lunette which was uh, one of the first convolutional neural networks dating back already to the 90s and if you use convolutional networks so if you use networks with local connectivity with weight sharing i'll talk a bit about that what that means in a second then you get very good performance right so uh, here i'm showing you the performance of the winning entry in the image net challenge which is a big uh, image classification challenge and you can see that in you know the first year when neural network actually won uh, was in 2012 when Hinton uh, and, and his co-workers introduced Alex Nat. And that really changed uh, the game for image recognition. And you can see that in the following years, maybe the numbers are a bit small, but really the classification uh, error on this ImageNet challenge, it went down from something like 
in 2010 to something that's below 1% um, these days. So the key point here is that, you know, combining or like having an architecture that exploits the symmetries in your data, it really gives you a very powerful uh, machine learning tool, okay? But for many data types, it's actually not quite clear what the symmetry is, right? So if I give you, going back to the protein folding example in the beginning, if I give you amino acid sequences, um, what's the right symmetry here? Uh, what's the right symmetry that you should take into account when you're designing a neural network that um, predicts the 3D structure of a protein? It's really not that clear. And so kind of the hope or the, the dream in, in, in deep learning would be to learn the right architecture directly from the data, to start with something very basic, to start with some kind of fully connected network, and then have the network see some images and have it figure out by itself that, ah, there's some kind of translation symmetry here, I should be convolution. This would be the, 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 the goal here. Does that make any sense, uh, this idea of data symmetry and architecture? Maybe this is a good point to, to ask a question. To me, it makes sense. Okay, good, thanks. I was quite happy I'm hard. giving it to you. Um, I just had some people here asking me something. All right, so can we learn the right architecture from data? So can we start you know, with a fully connected network on images and then learn some kind of convolutional structure? Well, it turns out this is actually hard. So just to make clear what I mean when I say convolutional structure, there's sort of two hallmarks that make a network convolutional. So one is the local connectivity, okay? So in a fully connected uh, neural network, right? If you look at a neuron in the first hidden layer, it will be connected to all the pixels of the images, right? Um, whereas in a convolutional network, instead a neuron in the hidden layer, it only looks at a small patch of the input image or, you know, somewhere deep in the network, a neuron will only look at a small subset of neurons in the previous layer, right? So you have this local connectivity and you have weight sharing. So um, this, this neuron, it's going to look at a small part of the input image, but then you can think about it as sort of running across the image, right? So it's going to apply the same filter to all the two times two patches or three times three patches of the image. And this is what in neuroscience is something called uh, tessellation of input space, right? So that you split the input space into many small patches and then you do the same operation on all of these small patches. And so the question would be, okay, can we start with a fully connected network, train it on images and get this kind of structure back? And the result here is, is, is broadly speaking negative. So first of all, fully connected networks perform worse on image classification, okay? So this is something that maybe you've already tried that you will never get the same performance uh, with even a deep, big, fully connected network as you would get with a convolutional network. And this prompted some people to, to you know, really study this issue a bit more carefully. And I really like this paper, for example, from Gregor Urban and his colleagues from, I think now five or six years ago, who asked, you know, do deep convolutional nets really need to be deep and convolutional? And they did a lot of careful ablation studies and they found that, yes, they do. Uh, they really need to be deep and convolutional. It really gives you some kind of advantage um, in terms of final performance. But if you think about it, this is a bit strange, right? Because um, any convolutional network can be expressed by a fully connected neural network, right? The weight matrix of that fully connected network, it will look a bit funny. It will be very sparse due to the local connectivity. It will have some kind of block structure because of the weight sharing, but still convolutional networks are a subclass of fully connected networks. And in fact, uh, because the convolution is a linear operation, they basically form some kind of hypersurface in the space of fully connected networks. So what that means is that the problem here is really dynamical. And this was um, nicely also shown by, by Stefan Dasculi in this nearest paper from three years ago uh, and, and by Benam Neshabur. So the problem is that uh, fully connected networks, they can express convolutions, but if we train them with stochastic gradient descent, you're not finding these solutions. Okay, and you're not finding them because there's some kind of, I guess, entropic barrier uh, in the way. You can, for example, train a convolutional network, map it back to a fully connected one, and train that with SGD, and that will be stable. You will, you know, you will keep the the accuracy. So, convolutions are a solution also to SGD in the fully connected weight space, but SGD just doesn't get there from random initial conditions. And um, yeah, in in unsupervised learning, some people have found some localization in the receptive fields, but these were sort of very particular um, data models 
Um, but what we really would like to have is, is some kind of supervised learning task where you can learn these convolutions from scratch. Okay, and so with um, Alessandro Ingrosso, who's a, who's a postdoc also here at ICDP in, in Trieste, we started looking at this problem and we wanted to understand a little bit better sort of what's in the way of a fully connected when it learns um, convolutions. And so um, this is the first paper that I, I want to talk about. And so the idea here that we started from both uh, Alessandro and me, we have this sort of background in, in statistical physics was to, you know, first of all, get rid of the images and 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 try to model images, okay? So try to come up with a model of data on which a good, a, a two-layer network can then learn convolutions. So try to understand, okay, what do you actually need to, to learn them from scratch, okay? And so the first thing that we wanted to put into our data model was translation invariance. So we cooked up this very simple task where you have some translation invariant um, Gaussian images. They have mean zero, and the covariance between any two pixels, it's just a function of the distance between these two pixels, okay? So in other words, I'm showing you two example images here. The, the correlation between any two pixels in any of these images, it only depends on their distance, okay? And that's what makes these Gaussians translation invariant. And to be doing the whole thing in 2D here to make it sort of uh, visually reminiscent of images, but this is really not so important. The key thing that we put in here is the translation invariance. And once you do that, you really only have one free parameter in your, in your model, and that's the correlation length of the pixels, right? And so here, as a task, we chose a very simple binary classification task. We wanted the network to learn the difference between images in which the correlations are short range versus images in which the correlations are long range, right? And so I'm showing you an example of uh, these images, one for each class here on the left. And you can see that indeed uh, there's a difference in the correlation length. One image is changing faster than, than the other. And so now you can generate many samples from this, from this mixture of Gaussians, okay? And you can train a neural network on it. So here we took a very simple, fully connected uh, two-layer neural network, 100 hidden neurons, okay? We trained that using vanilla stand, uh, stochastic gradient descent. And it reaches a good performance. You know, if you make the two correlation lengths different enough, you reach something like maybe 90% classification accuracy. And then after training, we wanted to understand, okay, what did we learn? So what we did is we, we took the trained network and we looked at the weights of the neurons in the hidden layer, okay? And so what I'm showing you here, these eight rectangles on the right, they're basically uh, the weight vector of eight of these neurons uh, reshaped into, into 2D, okay? And you can see that at the end of training, the population of neurons basically is split into two groups, okay? So there are roughly half and half neurons, which, which look like this, and I'm showing you, you know, some examples here. There are these sort of what we call low-frequency neurons, uh, whose weights are sort of slowly oscillating. And there are these high frequency neurons where weights are oscillating very fast. And so we try to understand a little bit where this, where this particular weight pattern um, came from. First of all, is it clear what we are looking at here on the right? Yes. Okay, great. But um, I'm heavily biased, I would say. Oh, can I just ask, uh, this is, this is trained on both type of images, this network? Yes. With... Okay. So yes, we're training it on a, on a classification task. So there's a data set where half the images have short range correlations okay. and the other one have long range correlations. And I want okay. you to you know, be able to predict which one's which. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you look a bit closer at these images, you'll find that uh, they don't just look like something is oscillating. They really are 2D superposition of uh, Fourier components, low frequency Fourier components. And if you think a bit, a bit more about it a bit more, you realize that this actually makes sense because um, the covariance matrix, if it has this translation invariant structure, it's something that's called a circulant matrix, okay? And circulant matrices have this property that they can be exactly diagonalized in the Fourier spectrum. So in other words, what the network is doing here is principal component analysis, right? It's decomposing the covariance uh, whose eigenvectors are Fourier components. So it's looking at the principal components of the data and it's using that to differentiate the short range from the long range correlations. And this makes sense because this is the Gaussian data. So the best that you can do in some sense is, is looking at the covariance, right? This is the only statistical information that's not trivial here. But okay, from our point of view, we wanted to, to learn convolutions, right? We wanted, for example, to have weights which are localized in space. So this is not great, right? Fourier waves are in a sense extended in space. It's exactly the opposite of what we wanted. So in other words, just the translation invariance, it's, it's not enough to make the simple network learn convolutions. 
And then we went back a little bit to, to the literature and there's, especially in neuroscience, quite a rich literature on, on what makes an image, you know, what are the atoms uh, of an image. And one thing that comes up repeatedly is the importance of edges, right? So edges are very important if you want to segmentate your environment, if you want to, to see something. And Gaussians are, of course, very blurry. So how do we get edges? Well, we took the same Gaussian translation variant inputs, but we fed them through a saturating nonlinearity. Okay, so in this case, we took the error function, which is uh, a little bit like a hyperbolic tangent. It just does nice integrals under the Gaussian measure. So that's where we took it. And the important thing here is that it saturates, right? So if its argument is very big, it saturates either plus one or minus one. And so we took the error function of these Gaussians and note that there's this little prefactor G in here. It's just a scalar number. And what this prefactor does is essentially controls how strongly nonlinear uh, the arrow function is, right? It controls the steepness of the arrow function around the origin. And so here I'm showing you samples from our Gaussian mixture for different values of this value G, which we call the gain. And you can see that as I increase the gain, I make the nonlinearity steeper around zero and I get sharper edges, right? So this gives me a controllable parameter um, to control the sharpness of the edges. The flip side of the sharp edges from a statistical point of view, is that I'm increasing the importance, the relative importance of the higher order cumulants, right? So for the Gaussian, of course, all the cumulants after the covariance are zero. For the non-Gaussian uh, images, now as I increase the gain, the relative importance of these higher order cumulants increases. Okay, so now I took, uh, we, we took these images generated from this nonlinear Gaussian process. Uh, we made it such that the, you know, we have this normalization factor to make sure that the variance of the image is always the same independently of the gain. Uh, we also made it such that the covariance of these images is actually the same. So both of the images that I show here, uh, they have the same covariance and it's only the higher order cumulants which are different. And this is going to be important later. And then we trained the network again on this type of data. And we found that after training, you find these kind of weights. So... This is pretty. This was pretty striking to us, and we were very happy because now instead of going to these Fourier components, which are extended in space, the weights localized, right? So here I'm again showing the weight vectors of a couple of the neurons. They again split into two classes. There is still this high frequency oscillatory class of neurons, but then roughly half of them have this very localized weight. So this weight is essentially zero everywhere. So all the dark blue is small fluctuations around zero, and then there's a couple of weights in different points, which are much larger. And this is not just something you can inspect visually, but this is also something you can measure, right? So you can measure, for example, something like the, the inverse participation ratio or the, the, the effective kurtosis of this weight vector, right? So you basically take the vector, you take its elements to the fourth, and you divide by uh, the square of the elements squared, okay? And if you, if you, this is a kind of a measure of, of, of kurtosis. And if you do this in the Gaussian case, you can see that the kurtosis of the weights, it stays flat. And it stays flat both for the low and the high frequency neurons. Whereas here, if you train on the non-Gaussian data, you can see that for the oscillatory neurons, it stays flat. But the localization of the neurons can be clearly seen here as something that happens at a sort of, you know, this specific point in time, right? So initially the, the weights stay Gaussian, or at least, you know, the kurtosis is, is close to zero. And then at some point, suddenly there's a transition and the half of the weights, half of the neurons localize in space. So this is quite nice. This is one of the hallmarks of, of convolution that I talked about in the beginning, right? This, this localization, this local connectivity of neurons. And here it really emerged in a purely data-driven uh, way, right? We didn't change anything about the algorithm. It's still stochastic uh, gradient descent, vanilla SGD. Um, we also checked that um, these receptive fields are spread out evenly in input space. So here I'm showing you um, basically the center of each of the localized neurons now uh, plotted across the whole of uh, the input space. And you can see that they nicely tessellate the input space, right? They're nicely, they are nicely spread evenly throughout the whole of this 2D plane, so that's nice. That's the second hallmark of, of convolutions. We also trained a simple convolutional network on this task and looked at its filters. So this is what I'm showing you here on the bottom right. And you can see that for different kernel sizes of these convolutions in the first layer, you basically always get roughly the same weight. Uh, and it really looks a lot like the weight that you get 
from uh, training a weight in the fully connected network, right? So here I'm showing this in, in, in 1D, um, but yeah, like I guess that uh, whether it's 1D or 2D doesn't really make a big difference. Okay, are there any questions up to, up to this point? So the bottom line here is really that, okay, somehow on this synthetic task, on the synthetic data, the fully connected network was able to learn a convolution with one filter from scratch. And now this should be, you know, very confusing to you because I spent the first couple of slides explaining how fully connected networks uh, do not learn convolutions on images that they perform worse. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not, of course, saying that this is not true anymore. Um, we have a very specific setup here, but it still begs the question of what's going on in this particular setup, right? So what, why are the neural networks learning these convolutions on this kind of data? What's going on here? And so with Ale, we try to, to, to dig a little bit deeper and, and go beyond the numerics to try to understand what's, uh, what's going on here. And, um, we tried a few of the tools that you usually use in, in, in the theory of, of neural networks to understand or to analyze neural networks. Uh, for example, you could try and look at this in the context of deep linear networks, which are a particularly popular toy model of neural networks, but this doesn't work because, you know, deep linear networks, they are only, uh, they only see the covariance of your data. So they only see the second moments. And here we had to go, you know, to non-Gaussian data to actually see this effect. So I don't want to go into, into too much detail on this. Uh, we can maybe talk about this in the questions, but basically all, all the ideas also on, on Gaussian universality that people have in the, in the community, they really break down here exactly when the receptive fields form. So we had to do something different. And so instead of telling you all the things that didn't work, let me just tell you what worked in the end or what at least, you know, was the first step in the, in the right direction, we think. And then if you have questions on this, we can come back later in the, in the Q and A. So, okay. If we want to understand why the non-Gaussian inputs generate these localized fields, let's let's simplify the model even even further. Let's keep the same data, but now let's look at the at a single neuron. Okay, so uh, this is also called the perceptron, in, sometimes in the literature, right? So we now just have one neuron um, which takes one of these non-Gaussian inputs and produces an output. And in fact, we're going to here take a neuron which has this cubic um, activation function. And so if you make the task simple enough, so for example, if you really have a big gap between the correlation lengths, even the simple neuron, it will do a decent ta job at differentiating the images and its weight will also localize. So this is still, you know, keeping enough of the phenomenology to, to warrant a closer look. The nice thing about looking at just a single neuron is that we only have one weight vector that we need to keep track of. Okay, so here we can really just write down the gradient flow dynamics of the single weight. And this is the equation uh, here down at the bottom. Okay, so um, either is the learning rate. I have to, I'm taking the average over the inputs here. So I have to sum over the two classes of inputs. But basically, if you expand the gradient flow equation up to third order in the weights, you get an equation that looks like this. Okay, and so you have two terms. One is linear in the weights and the other is cubic in the weights. And the, the weights, the linear and the cubic term, they are contracted with two tensors which depend on the inputs, on the inputs per class, okay? So C here is the class-wise covariance of my inputs. So it's the average over the inputs in, in one class, and then I'm summing over both of them. And T is, is a tensor, it's the fourth order moment of the, of the inputs, all right? And this fourth order moment is then contracted over three indices with the, with the three weights. So it's a nonlinear dynamic in the weights, and the two parts of the data that come in here are this second and fourth order moment. Is this clear? Well, are there any questions on what kind of dynamics we're looking at here? Okay, great. I don't Just see any. The X, I are the inputs, is that? That's yes, the... exactly. Okay, thank you. So the XI are the inputs that I've drawn from this non-Gaussian mixture, right? And here the sort of I, J, K, L, that's the, the, the pixels. And then the mu is indicating which class I'm talking about. So mu equal one is one class, mu equal two is the other. Okay, so I have this gradient flow dynamics now up to, up to third order. And what I want to do, remember, is I want to understand what's the difference now if I train on Gaussian inputs versus when I train on the non-Gaussian inputs, right? Because on the Gaussian inputs, I get Fourier components and on the non-Gaussian inputs, I get localized receptive fields. 
So if I want to compare these Gaussian to non-Gaussian dynamics, well, the first term is actually very nice because it's not going to change, right? The covariance of the inputs is going to be the same in both cases. And this is sort of by construction, right? Because I always choose my Gaussian such that they have the same covariance as the non-Gaussian images, right? So up to the second moment, the mean is zero, but up to the second moment, these inputs look exactly the same, statistically speaking. So the big difference then appears at the level of the fourth order moment. Right. And this fourth order moment, to uh, it can be split, right? So you can split that into two parts. One, which is its Gaussian part, if you will. It arises from the Gaussian fluctuations, and it's just written as a product of the covariance matrices. And this is the green term here at the, at the bottom. And then if inputs are non-Gaussian, there's also a, a genuinely fourth order term, and that's called the cumulant. And this is the orange uh, delta T here, right? And so this cumulant is essentially measuring the, the amount of non-Gaussian fluctuation in the fourth order moment. Or if you think about this physically, you know, if you have like four particles that are interacting with each other uh, through pairwise interactions, they will also be have they will also have correlations between the four of them, but they will just be a product of these two-body interactions, right? Whereas this delta T term, it's a genuinely fourth body interaction, it's a genuinely fourth order term. And this delta T is of course zero for the Gaussian inputs but it's non-zero non for the inputs with sharp edges, right? And so I can use this decomposition to rewrite the gradient flow um, into a Gaussian part and a non-Gaussian part, okay? So I haven't done any change to the equation that I've showed you previously. I've just sort of separated the Gaussian from the non-Gaussian contributions, okay? And so the green part of the gradient flow equation is gonna be the same, when you train on Gaussian non-Gaussian data, but when you train on non-Gaussian data, you have this additional orange term, this, this uh, cubic term in the weights, which acts a little bit like a source term. So this is kind of where the magic happens. This is the difference. This is what drives the weights towards the localization, okay? So how can we understand how it does then? A simple or like a, a good tool for this task is to look at the tensor decomposition of this, of this cumulant, okay? And, the tensor decomposition, you can think of that just in analogy to uh, a spectral decomposition of a matrix, right? So the covariance matrix, for example, I can I can rewrite this as a sum over eigenvalues times uh, the outer product of eigenvectors, right? And with the cumulant, I can do a very similar thing, right? So I can write this as a sum over uh, an outer product of vectors. And okay, in this case, it's gonna be an outer product if you will to the fourth, because I have four indices, this is a fourth order tensor. And this tensor decomposition, I'm writing it down here, um, for this four order tensor, and I'm also giving you a visual illustration, if you will, in the case of a three-dimensional tensor. And because our tensor is symmetric, uh, because I can change any index, I can permute any pair of indexes as I want, I actually am assured that this kind of decomposition exists. So this is nice. Um, there was a very nice recent work by uh, Ocker and Buse that came out at Neurops last year, where they showed that these tensor decompositions are actually very important to understand uh, nonlinear hep rules, which is sort of a very simple neural unsupervised learning algorithm. Okay, and so here we were kind of wondering, okay, what does it mean in our supervised in our supervised context? Okay, you can compute these um, eigenvectors numerically. You can't compute them exactly; you have to go through some kind of approximation scheme. But there are packages that do that for you, uh, and we can talk about that if if you're interested. But basically, what happens now with the eigenvectors is what we were wondering. And so here what I'm showing you is um, if I have almost Gaussian inputs, so in other words, I have a small gain, my inputs are non-Gaussian, but really they still look very blurry. Okay, so my, my non-linearity is very, very linear around, uh, around zero. And then what I'm showing you here in gray are the first 10 leading eigenfactors or CP factors as they're called in this business of, of tensor decomposition. Okay, so these are the gray lines. And you can see that they are oscillating quite a lot. Okay, so they 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 really oscillate. There's there's no real structure that, that at least I can identify here. And if I now train the perceptron on this data with this weekly Gaussian inputs, uh, at the end of training, I get this blue uh, weight vector, right, which is plotted here in blue. And you can see that it too, it, it it's kind of all over the place. And I wouldn't really call that localized, right? It's really oscillating. Maybe it's noisy. It's not very clear what it does. But now let's see what happens if we crank up the gain. So what happens if we make the edges really much sharper? And then something very surprising happens. At least we were very surprised when we saw that the CP factors now uh, undergo a kind of localization transition. 
Okay, so here in gray, again, I'm plotting the CP factors of the empirical fourth order cumulant that I've computed from my data. And you can see that they are now very localized in space, right? Each of them is only non-zero over a finite fraction of input space, and they sort of are spread out uh, in input space. And you can see that this is very significant also for the perceptron because as the CP factors localize, so does the weight. So if I train on this strongly non-Gaussian inputs at the end of training, my weight, it will be very much localized. Uh, you can see the final weight vector here in blue. And it really looks a lot like one of these uh, CP factors, right? So in other words, these CP factors of the tensor, they are some kind of attractors to the dynamics, right? So the weight is asymptotically converging towards one of these CP factors. And as you make the Gaussians, uh, as you make the inputs increasingly non-Gaussian, as you make the edges sharper, the CP factors, they change. They go from something that's sort of a bit all over the place to something that's strongly localized. And this localization is a consequence of the translation variance. Like if you tried this with just Gaussians, which have some covariance matrix, which is not necessarily translation invariant, you don't get this localization. Okay. So this is, I think, uh, the, the key slide for, for this part of the talk. So I think it's, a, it, it's another good moment to pause maybe and to uh, let that sink in a little bit and maybe ask a question. So, so if, I, if I may, um, this what you present here is, is, is synthetic data, right? Yes, so far I'm only talking about synthetic data. Yes. So how would these statistics look like if you're looking at real data? Would it be more like be in between or on, on one of the extremes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, that's that's something we asked ourselves too. Um, and so we had a look. Uh, of course, you know, there are some numerical uh, problems of even computing these fourth order tensors, right? Because this gets very intensive in terms of memory. Decomposing them becomes very... Uh, expensive in terms also of, of computations. So we were only able to do this on, on MNIST in the MNIST dataset, which is these, this handwritten digits dataset. And there the CP factors, they really look a bit all over the place. So they're a lot closer to what I'm showing you in, on the green side here, on the Gaussian side, than on the non-Gaussian side, right? And, and this makes sense, I guess, to some extent, because the images are centered, right? So they're a lot less translation invariant than, than our inputs here. And translation variance is sort of a key ingredient. And then again, also, you know, something needs to be different in real data, right? Because if I train the same fully connected network on images from MNIST, I don't get convolutions. I don't get this localization, right? So in other words, what I'm saying here is that if you have this very strong non-Gaussianity and this very clean translation variance, then you see P factors, they localize like this. And you this is actually where your weight goes. So by understanding the CP factors, at least in the simple model, you understand where the weight goes. Okay, thanks. I have... yeah, it's, a, it's a good, also we can discuss about it a bit later, sort of what this, you know, how to extend this also to, to, to actual images and to understand uh, what's going on with actual images. I have a question. So yes. you are presenting these things that it's for the, for the low frequency things, the Gaussian separate. But mm -hmm. to me, it seems reasonable that also the high frequency atoms would separate at some point do you have a reason why they do not separate so I don't know what do you mean by separate so you have you showed at the beginning that uh, as soon as you make the edges sharper mm -hmm. from getting something that is just you know uh, some low frequency stuff uh, yeah something that is low frequency and concentrated so yeah. From a, just from a, oh, how would I design this if I had to, rather than how, if I can do something, I would also separate the, the high frequency stuff into localized things. So sort of a localized gobble frame. Well, I mean that, the high frequency neurons, the quickly oscillating weights of the neurons. Exactly. So why don't they, lo yeah. would they localize? I mean, I think it might be just numerical instability that they do not localize. Or I would really expect them also to localize. <laughs> And That's I a really good question. Why it doesn't localize for for full images in my in, so this is my very you know biased view on this thing because yeah. a full image would would contain all sorts of frequencies so it's just too big of a mess right because yeah. you would separate all frequency bands at the same time and 
we can we saw that already for two sort of frequency bands it was difficult to get the the localization in both channels right you got it in the low frequency channel because that is mm -hmm. probably numerically more stable rather than the highly oscillating one I, in the end you have to stuff it into a vector right and yes. vectors are harder than smooth vectors sort of Absolutely, yeah. so, um but Maybe we can discuss it a little bit later, but you know, coming from dictionary learning background, I have a very biased view on this, and I'm, I'm very happy so far. But just maybe one moment because they people do seem to learn dictionaries also with tensor decomposition. Is there a connection there? Uh, this is very cool. So maybe let me first ask answer you for the, on the on the neurons. So the short answer is we don't really know why these low frequency uh, high frequency neurons don't localize too. Um, but it's something you observe very consistently. You also just can't cut them out. Like they are relevant for the network. Mm -hmm. I I think there might also be something to do with the way we set up this task because it's a binary classification task. To me, these high frequency neurons, they're a bit like a baseline. And, you know, they, 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 they react. And then if only they react, then you say, okay, it's the, the high frequency class or it's one of the two classes and then only if the neurons which are tuned to the frequency of the other images if they get excited too you then say i ah, actually know it's the other images it's yeah you're side. right it's enough if one separates because you you can just sort of a test it's a it's a binary thing it's one or the other exactly yeah, okay. and like you were saying i think it's also very important that we were very you know we really have this one correlation length here in, in, in each class right so you really just need to look at one thing you need to look at one length scale and it will it will tell you what's what's going on yeah um but now to 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 uh, to to go to your second question um yeah no this is a very good this is a very interesting question right and for also for us sort of we were very much inspired by this work for example of of all thousand fields you know who had all these very clever very elegant algorithms to learn to learn dictionaries and i think there is a there is a connection here um i think what's interesting here is that you some of the network seems to turn this question, the supervised problem, into an unsupervised one, right? And somehow I think here in this particular mixture task, it, it's turning the, the question of differentiating these two classes into somehow finding a good dictionary for them, finding a good representation, and then using that to, to differentiate them, right? But I think, and this is something that we're also thinking about at the moment, that the density composition might really be a link between the two. Yeah, well, I'm just because there are people who use some sort of, I mean, I, I, I'm not a physicist, so if I hear tensor, I run a mile. Um, <laughs> and what, what should we call them? Using this as a tool for dictionary learning. So maybe just something that you can have a look at later. But I think well, we, should, yeah. we should continue with a nice talk. And then have no, no, but I mean, I, I'd much rather you know skip one slide and 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 talk about more about this. I think maybe just to add another thing here. So one way of learning dictionaries or like one class of algorithms of, for learning interesting projections of your data and hence interesting features, right? Are these independent components? No. Like you, you look for projections which somehow or projection pursuit which somehow maximize the non-Gaussianity of your projections or or, so, or like a measure of non-Gaussianity, something like this, right? And in these networks, we see something very similar. Like the moment that the weights start to localize, the pre the, the statistics of the pre-activation, so the statistics of the weights times the images, it becomes very non-Gaussian too. In some sense, implicitly here, the network is solving some kind of independent component uh, analysis problem, some kind of dictionary learning. So I think the two are linked, but you know, working out the details, it's 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 exciting, but not so clear. All right, let me see. So um it's 46. So how many more minutes should I, should I talk? What do you think? I think we had a lot of questions now that Axel can edit into making them questions later if he thinks that's necessary. Let's go for 10 more minutes. With, will that suffice? Great. Yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. No problem. I'll, I'll do it as you, as you want. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so, so this is what I want to say about this, um, this problem of learning the convolutions, and then maybe for the last couple of minutes, um, I can I can show you some other work that we're doing at the moment, which I also think is quite interesting. So we saw that the, the higher order input statistics are really key to understanding learning, and that they help perform. So if I uh, if you look at this plot here, this is um, the prediction mean squared error, so the test error of the networks uh, when they are trained on the Gaussian or on the non-Gaussian data. 
Okay, so for now, just look at the solid lines. So blue is a network that's been trained on the Gaussian data and orange is a network that's been trained on the orange, on the non-Gaussian data. And you can see that, first of all, at the end of training, you do better on the non-Gaussian data. So you do a better job of classifying the non-Gaussian images, the images of the sharp edges. And I think that makes sense because in some sense, this task is richer statistically speaking, right? So in the Gaussian case, you only have the covariance to look at. And once you know the covariance, you know everything about the data, uh, and then you can do your principal component analysis. In the non-Gaussian case, you can look at the covariance, but you can also look at the higher order cumulant of the data, and they will also be different between the two classes. So there's more stuff, more statistical information that you can somehow exploit. And some of the network seems to be able to do that. There's a gap. The other thing that I found striking when I was, when I was making this plot is that initially though, so this is for networks which start from the same initial conditions, Initially, these two curves are pretty much on top of each other. And this is, you know, plotted as a function of time, which is the number of SGD steps divided by D. So this is really a couple of thousand of steps of SGD. It makes no difference for the networks whether they're trained on the Gaussian or the non-Gaussian data. And this got me thinking like, okay, when do you actually learn about these higher order input statistics? And so we, um, we experimented a little bit with this uh, over the summer. And uh, we wanted to do this also in, in sort of bigger networks, okay, right? So here we really went sort of towards the other end of the spectrum. And we took um, this deep neural network, it's called the DenseNet. It's one of several architectures that do a pretty good job these days in image classification. And we trained it on, image, on images on Cypher 10, which is sort of a classic image benchmark, okay? And I'm sure it's 10 classes, and I'm showing you two examples of, you know, one class is uh, horses, the other class is, is frogs. And if you train this dense net on this task, uh, you see here the, the accuracy goes up to something like 90%, which is fairly decent. Now, what we did is we did basically the same game that we played uh, previously. We made a Gaussian clone of the data. Okay, so basically I fit a Gaussian mixture with one Gaussian per class to these images in Cypher 10. And then I drew a new data set from this uh, Gaussian from this Gaussian mixture. And the idea here is that being a Gaussian mixture, if I look at now the images in one particular class, these inputs will have the same mean and uh, covariance matrix, but all the higher order cumulants will be zero. So essentially I've, I've deleted all the higher order cumulants from Cypher 10 and made a new data set. And what I can do now is I can take the dense net, I can train it on these Gaussian images and evaluate it on Cypher 10. And this is what I show you in the in the green line, okay? So again, this is a network. I, I'm always showing you the test accuracy on Cypher 10 images. So on the real images, like the ones here on the right, the dark line is a network that's actually been trained on the true images, whereas the green line is a network that's been trained on just the first two, if you will, cumulants of the data. And you can see that asymptotically, you do worse, right? If you want to classify Cypher 10, it's much better if you have access to all the moments, to all the cumulants than just to the first two. But if you look at the early stages of training for the first, let's say, 10 steps, this very deep network with convolutions, with uh, residual connections, it's got, I don't know, 30 layers or something like this, doesn't matter. It's only seeing the first two moments of its data, right? And in other words, if, if for the first 10 steps, whether I looked at the Gaussian data or Cypher 10 images makes no difference. Does that make sense, this experimental setup? Okay. Now, ideally, we'd like to sort of extend this uh, this idea even even higher, right? So, ideally, we'd like to now fit a distribution to Cypher ten where the first I don't know m cumulants are non-zero and all the other ones are zero. Unfortunately, uh, this is not possible. So, there's a mathematical uh, theorem that tells you that the the characteristic function or the cumulant generating function of uh, of a distribution it either has one terms, two terms, or infinitely many. So in other words, as soon as you turn on the third cumulant, you're turning on all of them. So what, what can you do? Um, what we did is uh, we spent some time training rating basically uh, generative adversarial networks on each class, okay? It actually turns out this this, this uh, cost me a lot of life expectancy. It's actually quite hard to train again on a set of images while keeping you know the mean and the covariance exact. Uh, but okay, you can use something that's called the Wasserstein gun. It's a slightly modified algorithm. And with this, you get images like the ones that I show here. So this is already looking a little bit more like a horse or a frog than these Gaussian images. 
but we also made sure that the mean and the covariance of these images are still the same as in the Gaussian, right? So in a sense here, this distribution of data, it's really in between Cypher 10 and the Gaussian clone. It's not quite Cypher 10, but it's already got some higher order cumulants which are missing from the Gaussian. And you can see that indeed, if I train now on this WGAN mixture and I evaluate on Cypher 10, I get an accuracy on Cypher 10, which is the same as the network that's been trained on Cypher 10 for about a thousand steps. So for the first thousand steps or so, the, the deep network hasn't looked at anything in Cypher 10 that's not already also present in, in the Wasserstein gun. And similarly, uh, you know, we, we trained an, an even bigger network uh, diffusion or so actually we didn't do this, but there's a data set in the literature where Nakiran et all, they trained a big diffusion model on, on the whole of Cypher 10. They labeled this with a big pre-trained model uh, to get another clone of Cypher 10. You can see that the image is already even better than the ones that come from the GAN. Like this actually looks like a, like a frog, at least to me. And this does an even better job at approximating Cypher 10 for an even longer amount of time. Right? So in other words, what I find striking here is that these different curves, it's clear that they will end up at different places, right? It's clear that, you know, you train on these different data sets, you validate in Cypher 10, you will not get the same accuracy. What I find striking though, is that these curves collapse on top of each other. So in other words, it really looks like the network here, it's learning distributions of increasing complexity of its data, right? So it's learning, it figures out that there's 10 classes and then the course of, of training, the course of learning can really be understood as getting increasingly more accurate models, statistically speaking, of each class, right? And, and, and this is interesting because this fits in nicely with some of the things that have been discussed in the literature with these so-called simplicity bias of, of neural networks, right? So this idea that neural networks don't overfit because they learn simple functions first, right? They first learn like a linear function and then they start fitting increasingly higher order terms. And you can think that this could prevent you from, from overfitting, right? And here we see something similar, but on the level of distributions, right? So instead of immediately looking at some very, you know, high order statistics in Cypher 10, in the beginning of the network, it only looks at its first two moments of each class, and then it works its way up. And this is something that we found in, in different networks. So I showed you the dense net. We also tried this in a ResNet, which is another sort of deep convolutional neural network. We tried this in a visual transformer. This is a, a different type of architecture, which, hasn't, which doesn't have convolutions, but which is very powerful. Uh, comes from natural language processing. It does a very different way to analyze images, so that's why we tried it, but it gives you the same, the same story, the same idea. What I found most striking is that you could now argue that this is, well, a fact that you start from, you know, initial weights, which are random IID draws from some distribution. So in the beginning, you know, take an image, you take the dot product with some IID weights, this thing is going to look roughly Gaussian, so it's actually not so surprising. So for this, we did an experiment with a uh, ResNet 18 that was pre-trained on another image data set, right? So in practice, what people do a lot is if they have these very big networks, they train them on, on ImageNet, which is this huge data set with millions of images. They train it on this classification task there, and then they take the trained network and they start from these weights to train on another data set, right? So you pre-train on ImageNet and then you transfer these weights and you, you train in this case on Cypher 10. Now, of course, if you pre-trained on, on ImageNet for a long time, this means your weights are going to be big, your weights are going to be correlated. They're as far away from the weight distribution as they can be. And yet, if we take these pre-trained networks and we repeat the same experiment, uh, we get the same behavior. And this is what I'm showing you here on the left. So this is now for the same experiment as before, but now the resident has been pre-trained on, on ImageNet. You can see, or maybe it's better, the learning is faster. Okay, so previously it took me like maybe a thousand steps to reach 60% accuracy. Here I get there in, in maybe a hundred steps. So this is kind of reassuring. So there is really a change. Learning is much faster. But in terms of the statistical moments that the dead network looks at, it's still the same progression. Like you still initially only look at the Gaussian at the first two moments per class. Then, you know, you only look at all the statistics that are already contained in the Wasserstein gun and, and so on. So this learning of distributions of increasing complexity, it really seems to be something that's robust and that's not you know, conditioned on having IID weights uh, in the beginning. And so that's something I find quite interesting and we're just in the last steps of, of writing this up. Um, it also you know, begs some questions about what do you actually learn from pre-training, right? So 
there is some notion, you know, some very anthropomorphic or, uh, notion, I guess, of, you know, if you train on some kind of image data set, you learn some kind of concepts, you learn edge detectors, you learn about composition, you learn about whatever. And these concepts are then useful and can be transferred to another data set. And this is what speeds up learn. These results, I think they, they challenge that a little bit because while the learning is faster, it seems that the progression that you go through during learning is still the same, right? So maybe this is more about optimization. This is more about finding right uh, initial weights for your training. Uh, I don't know, but I think this is something worth worth looking into it uh, a bit more. Like I said, we're currently writing this up. We also have a, a sort of where we can analyze this theoretically, but okay, I'm not going to go uh, into into detail on 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 this. Uh, instead, let me just sort of wrap up and then maybe see if there's some more questions. So yeah, like I said in the first part of the talk, we we, we can learn convolutions um, from scratch, but you need the right statistical cues in your data, and you need some very strong statistical cues so i'm not saying of course that you know uh, this will extend easily to mnist or to cipher 10 but i think this is a nice way of showing the interaction between the structure and the data and the architecture that you get from from training on that data right so and the importance of the data statistics in steering your dynamics into a certain direction in weight space um this then led to this other observation that neural networks they seem to learn of distributions of increasing complexity, right? So they seem to work their way up the cumulants of their data distribution. And I think this might be, you know, some kind of simplicity bias, and this might help them to uh, avoid overfitting. And I think it's, uh, you know, something that we're still working on and trying to understand a bit better. And then finally, I think, um, you know, there's a lot about, uh, in theory, about obviously Gaussian inputs, Gaussian statistics, and that's a very good uh, starting point to do theory. And there's a lot of very exciting theory that's been done on this. But I think if you really want to be sort of uh, serious about understanding networks, especially deep networks, we'll need to get a handle on understanding how the higher order cumulants come in, right? So how do they influence the dynamics? How do they shape the, the representations that you learn with your networks? Um, I think that's really key. I think we can learn a lot from some more unsupervised uh, approaches, you know, like independent component analysis, dictionary learning. They've dealt with this for, for a long time. And so I think there's a lot to do in, in, in this direction. So let me finish by thanking uh, my two collaborators with which I this works. So Alessandro Ingrosso, uh, who was on both papers, who was a postdoc at ICTP. Uh, Maria Raffinetti was a PhD student in, in Paris. She now moved to, to London. And and yeah, uh, and finally, yeah, so I'm in I'm in Trieste uh, and uh, we're always you know interested in hearing from students who would who would like to work on this on this kind of stuff. Uh, we have a nice view. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. So thank you, Sebastian, for the very nice talk. Um, are there questions? So I, I would really like to give also the audience a chance for questions before I start to ask sure. questions again. Um, was there a question? So I have just one very fast question, maybe because we've had a lot yeah. of so do you think that this procedure where you've seen, okay, it's um, you can get to a certain accuracy with a certain amount of moments, is there a way to use this to make the learning faster in the sense that maybe this, uh, you can design your optimization procedure in a way that is uh, not taking care so much and therefore going doing a sort of cheap thing up to a certain level and then uh, just, you know, it, it, to, to build this into the, let's say, optimization procedure that, uh, look, at the beginning, it doesn't make sense to look at all the details. So let's just ignore them, but somehow gain uh, training speed. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. It's true that this is kind of suggestive. No, you, you would like to sort of design some kind of curriculum based on that or, yeah. Um, I don't know. We've, we've discussed this a little bit. I'm a bit... So from looking at these graphs, I'd like to think so, yes. Now, I'm a bit careful now because people have tried to design curricula for, um, for neural networks on images in particular. And to be honest, it hasn't really worked so well in the sense that, you know, no matter how clever the, the curriculum, at the end of the day, the best thing you can do is really training just on the full loss from the beginning. And, you know, it's going to be hard to beat. I think this might be interesting, maybe if you don't have that much data, for example, 
this might be, you know, sort of a principle, there might be a principled way of doing some kind of bootstrapping where you maybe train a distribution, you know, you fix some, you, you fit some Gaussians to your data, you train on that first, because now you can have as much data as you want. And then later you only train on, on the actual data that you have. Uh, maybe this is a way of making this work or, um, yeah, or maybe, yeah, something like this. But I think, you know, on things like Cypher 10 on ImageNet, when your job is to minimize one loss function, the best thing to do is just to, to minimize it. And I think their curricula will not help so, so much. Although I'd like to think that maybe here there's a way of getting a curriculum for small data sets or other difficult tasks. So thank you. Is there now questions from the, the rest of the audience? I also want to uh, say thank you again for the very nice talk and uh, all the slide titles with pop culture references. I don't know. If <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad they weren't appreciated. Uh, they were appreciated on my side, at least. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I couldn't talk much about the life, a day in the life of the perception, but. Uh, yeah, but you know, what's appreciated. we can all listen to the song now. So. Yeah, good. That's, that's, that's a deal. That's a deal. Okay, so if there's uh, no questions, then uh, I will also repeat uh, Frederick's comment. Great talk, thanks. So in the yeah. name, <laughs> great talk, thanks, and uh, hope to see you maybe in two weeks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you.